Uh, we welcome Ms. Melissa Hathaway. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, it's uh, my first time here to South Africa, so I'm very delighted to be here. I'll be here through next week and um, hoping to see much more of your country. And, uh, um, and um, I'm very honored to be following um, Mr. Thomas and uh, Professor Marwala. They were both very good presentations, and I think that you'll see parts of theirs and captured in mine as well. So I'm going to give uh, a start here. And um, so in a single generation, we've seen a dramatic change around the world. The world has become hyper-connected. <coughs> And as you start to see that, so has the global economy. It's become digital. It's now represented in more than $107 trillion, of which almost $20 trillion is the digital economy. And it's growing in each of our countries. This year alone, the digital economy represents an opportunity of $3.8 trillion for the information and communications technology businesses that our companies represent around the world. And in the next year, just in one year, we're going to connect another 30 billion devices to the internet, and that will represent another 8% of the digital economy, connecting people, places, and things. Industry 4.0, as, as Professor Marwala talked in his presentation, is going to dramatically change and capture more of the digital economy. <coughs> We are connecting our utilities to smart meters and smart grids. We're providing and fielding new buildings that are energy consumable based on the movement of people and or the consumption of our devices in them. We are connecting our agriculture with, inter with internet protocol devices so that we know where our cattle graze and what the chemicals and water requirements are of our crops. Our consumer, our consumer wearables and our manufacturing, et cetera, are all becoming internet-based. That automation is increasing productivity, but it's also increasing our vulnerability landscape <clears throat> dramatically. Our countries are racing to capture this digital opportunity and to position our companies to capture that digital economy and that opportunity. Yet, not all is well in paradise. Why is that? Well, to more than the, the cyber crime across the countries, and each of our countries is growing five times or year over year, 100%. And as we connected those people, places, and things, that fourth industrial revolution, the Internet of Things and industrial Internet of Things, has increased a 600% vulnerabilities to the core of the critical services and infrastructures that are being delivered by our governments and by our companies to our citizens. And when you start to think about how that vulnerability has increased, it's significant. The digital environment that we have created and we have fielded over the last 30 years is insecure. It's insecure by design, unfortunately. And we have embedded these information communications technologies in the core of our infrastructure. We've embedded them with the principle of field it fast and fix it later. It's known as Patch Tuesday in the United States and was introduced to us by Microsoft and then every other company since then of the software vendors. But unfortunately, Patch Tuesday leads to Vulnerable Wednesday. And that Vulnerable Wednesday of the 75 patches that were introduced last month, or the 100 plus from the month before, leads to months and months of vulnerability of your organizations, our governments, and consequently, our sovereign nations. When you start to look at that, it's easy to find these vulnerable infrastructures. These unpatched systems are available for search on the internet. They're easy to find. You just go to showdown.com, it's free, and it will show you every vulnerable device in this country, in my country, in your organization, your government institution. And these are things that we have to address. Patching is really basically going to be becoming dangerous and unaffordable. And I just recently wrote an article about this that we're never going to be able to catch up when one company can represent more than a thousand patches over a course of a year. When you start to think about that, 
Some of our governments like to say that the tools are exquisite and available only to our military and intelligence services. But they're not. They're cheap. They're available on the internet. They're easy, accessible, and affordable. So let's just give you a couple of examples. I can deliver a malware to any one of your computers for less than a dollar. I can execute a distributed denial of service for an hour or a day for only $20 to $30. And I can steal and use your personal identifiable information for just a few dollars, a cup of coffee if you think of it. And these are the, some of the things that we have to address, that the tools really are cheap, easy, accessible. I'm going to use them against our governments, against our institutions and our businesses. So when you start to think about that, every one of our businesses and government institutions is vulnerable and is being attacked. And if you don't think that you have been attacked, then you just aren't looking hard enough because every one of our organizations has been penetrated. It's a question of what are you losing? Are you losing money? Are you losing intellectual property? Are you losing personal identifiable information? Are you losing state secrets? And you have to start to think about it in those terms. When you start to think about that, as you have been penetrated, our intelligence services and our law enforcement, or your supply chain, your suppliers, your consumers, are the ones that are telling you that you've lost information. The average organization takes a little over six months to find that has a problem, and it's largely because somebody told them they had a problem, not because their tools were effective. And then once they figured out they had a problem, it takes more than 30 to 60 to 90 days to actually be able to do the forensic analysis to determine how long, how far, how wide, how deep, and how much has been lost during that time frame of vulnerability. Let's talk about just a few examples to kind of hit it home. <clears throat> As I said, the distributed denial of service attacks are increasing, and I was struck by Mr. Thomas's chart earlier that that's what's actually affecting this country and this region the most, the distributed denial of service attacks. So let's just talk about it. One hour distributed denial of service, US $10. I can knock you offline when you need to be online for one hour, $10. A day, $35. A week, not very much more than that. And then a whole month, less than 1500 US. Can you imagine your institution or your organization, your business being knocked offline for a full month when you need to be online. Could you price what that attack is per minute, per hour, per day for your shareholders to the value at risk of your organization? In the United States, we had a business disruption through distributed denial of service attack where security cameras were hijacked through the internet of things. They got a Mirai botnet. This was a few years ago, but this was instructive of why we have bad product in the market and how easy they are to attack and the vulnerability associated with them. The security cameras in, the, in New York um, cost, that were hijacked and created a distributed denial of service attack against one of our internet service providers that was providing the infrastructure backbone to connect the internet of hundreds of businesses. It cost hundreds of businesses 22,000 US dollars per minute for being offline when they needed to be online. They were offline for more than eight hours in one day. That starts to add up hundreds of millions of dollars because of a vulnerability in a security camera, admin, admin password that I was able to hijack and then use as a distributed denial of service attack against the core of an infrastructure, bringing down hundreds of businesses across the United States. That's significant. Then let's look at malware. Malware is kind of like penny candy, a dollar. I can get a handful of them and I can use them against your institutions. But this is also what's happening in the United States and elsewhere. That one dollar malware that I can buy for, you know, penny candy on the internet is being used against smart cities because they're really dumb cities that have been hyper-connected with core vulnerabilities in the core of their services. You may have read about the malicious software Sam Sam ransomware that actually knocked the city of Atlanta, one of the top 100 resilient cities in the world offline for weeks. Well, that was just one malicious software against one computer that moved lateral across many institutions, knocking core services offline and core 911 and emergency services offline for weeks. You might have read recently that we have another city right outside the national capital of the United States called Baltimore that's now been offline for more than eight weeks of all critical services 
And we don't believe that we're going to be able to restore those services in the United States for probably another four to six more months. The costs are growing at tens of millions of dollars in citizen-facing services of being able to pay your bills or be able to actually buy a house or rent an apartment are all offline because the city of Baltimore is offline. When you start to think about that, the cost of the city of Atlanta was just under 20 million and the cost of the city of Baltimore is just over 40 million and growing. How can we afford to have smart cities that can be so easily knocked offline like penny candy and one malicious software against one vulnerability from software vendors that are delivering us vulnerabilities on a monthly basis, just knocking them offline on a regular basis? We're also seeing malicious software being used against our industrial control systems here in, in, in Africa, Middle East, United States, etc. And they're being used to actually weaponize those industrial control systems for harm, to bring those industrial control systems to knock the safety systems offline, so to cause catastrophic harm. We've seen this in one of Saudi Aramco's um, petrochemical plants just recently in the Middle East where the, um, the industrial control system was infected. And thank God that we were able to find the malicious software and bring it offline and actually repair the systems before it actually blew up. And that's what's happening now as we're seeing malicious software being embedded in the core of our industrial control systems to knock them offline, to actually blow them up or to actually cause destructive damage to them. Industrial control systems run our water systems. Industrial control systems are the backbone of our electric power generation. Industrial control systems are the delivery mechanism for oil and gas, petrochemical, and a lot of manufacturing. And as these systems are being weaponized, we as countries have to do something about it. And the cost is growing, and the risk is chemical explosions, life, and safety. About a year and a half ago, we saw significant malicious software being embedded and used against a company in the Ukraine. It was an accounting company that was um, connected to many, many hundreds of actually global businesses in over a hundred countries. The malicious software was called NotPetya and it was targeted against a Microsoft vulnerability, which was an unpatched system in so many companies. That destructive malware actually spread around the world in less than four hours. And I'll just use this particular example of Maersk shipping. Maersk shipping represents 20% of global shipping in the global economy. Maersk Shipping had 45,000 computers, 4,000 servers, and 2,500 applications destroyed in less than four hours. It knocked them offline in 76 ports. They couldn't actually move product to market, and their ships were literally dead in the water. They didn't know it was on the manifest because that too was corrupted. It took them six weeks to rebuild their infrastructure, only because a few of their computers were offline due to an electric outage in Ghana and otherwise it would have taken them more than a year. The cost to them to rebuild their infrastructure was over 400 million US. That's just the capital cost of replacing the equipment. They lost 10% of their market share to the China, China Ocean Shipping Company. And they represented 7% of Denmark's GDP. 7% of one country's GDP in one company knocked offline. It starts to give you pause of what happens. We had other companies around the world that were affected in less than four minutes. Merck Pharmaceuticals knocked offline for cancer-saving drugs. We had Federal Express and TNT shut down all operations in Eastern Europe. And Mondelez, which is known for Oreo cookies and other confections like Cadbury chocolate, all offline couldn't actually bring their product to market. One malicious software, <coughs> Penny Candy, against one vulnerability, having $100 billion or more destructive damage around the world in more than 100 countries. And the costs are escalating still today. We're also seeing our financial institutions under duress, where our money is being targeted through our banks and the vulnerabilities in the SWIFT system. More than 25% of our banks have lost $10 million or more. We're also seeing our credit cards stolen on a regular basis out of our retail outlets. Most retail centers hotel chains, other kiosks have all been targeted because your credit card has a value in the underground market. 
And then every single cryptocurrency ch exchange has also been targeted because the cryptocurrencies, whether it's Monero or Bitcoin or Ethereum, all have value on the underground market. These two, these exchanges in South Korea, Canada, Japan, have all been targeted and they've lost hundreds of millions of these types of, um, of currency, again, being used in the underground market by countries like North Korea and others to get around their actual um, the uh, sanctions that we as countries have placed on them. It doesn't end there, though. We're starting to see our health and safety compromised as well because the vendors that are delivering products to actually help save our lives are not actually designing them, thinking about how they could be used for harm as they connect to the Internet. And so we're seeing product recall of pacemakers by Abbott Labs of 400,000 pacemakers. We're seeing Medtronics and Johnson & Johnson recall all of the insulin pumps for those people who have diabetes. And then we're seeing other major financial uh, recalls of capital equipment like x-ray machines and CAT scan machines that are storing your personal identifiable information on the machine itself unprotected. And so they represent an, an, an actual vulnerability to your personal identifiable information or the vulnerability to your life because these actual products can be manipulated over and through the internet and over and through wireless systems. It's time that our vendors start to actually take responsibility for delivering a better product and a well-engineered, less vulnerable product to market. In the United States, the United Kingdom did an unprecedented release last year of uh, what was going on in the, by the Russian government against our sovereign nations. And what we're seeing is, is that the Russian government is targeting those industrial control systems in our water, nuclear, oil and gas, and other infrastructures. The Director of National Intelligence in the United States um, has recently published a report saying that the risks posed by these government activities and against the vulnerabilities in the core of society are only going to grow. Remember, a 600% increase in the attacks and vulnerabilities using the Internet of Things. So we start to see this as the prosperity of these information technologies, the critical infrastructures, the vital national networks of our countries, the consumer devices that we have embedded within us or are embedded within our homes are all introducing vulnerabilities and they're going to change the way that we are in the calculus of how we should be thinking about risk. The next few years are going to propose things and challenges and we have to think about the innovations and in technology and warfare are intertwined, just like Professor Marwella said. Blockchain, quantum, artificial intelligence are going to be weaponized. The ledger of trust that you think about blockchain, I'm going to make it a ledger of distrust and you're never going to know the integrity of the data. Artificial intelligence is already being weaponized and being used for um, attacking the vulnerabilities in these software to make it smarter and faster to take down our institutions. And quantum computing will bring about great change, but it will also make it so that we have no more secrets and our technologies are being able to encrypt our data. So we have to start to think about things are escalating around the world and, um, and there's many international efforts to try to de-escalate this and deter escalation that we as countries are talking about that we cannot use and misuse information co communications technologies against each other and certainly against our core infrastructures. But that's not working so well among some of our countries. So now we're starting to say we have to prepare for war and other escalation. And in NATO, we've actually presented, seven countries have presented <coughs> offensive cyber weapons to NATO as an attempt to deter the escalation happening from other countries. We have also have um, Secretary Gutierrez from the United Nations is talking about this chance of warfare as a top seven threat to peace and stability and security among all of our countries and that we in the United Nations and the multilateral organizations must work together to ensure that we're not going to be misusing information communications technology in this new domain. There are some competing proposals that were introduced in the United Nations last year, and these negotiations just began this month in June, where we have an open-ended working group that was introduced by Russia involving all of our countries talking about the need for trying to address the cyber weapons that we're seeing used, this arsenal of weapons being used against our countries. Can we start to address this as an arms control regime? 
and start to limit use and inspection and bring about transparency in this domain. And then the United States um, continued, to, we proposed the continuing the government group of experts, which is a dialogue on how we continue to use and support the UN Charter and the current rules of the international order, specifically international law, um, in this domain. <coughs> We're also seeing um, the Organization for Security Cooperation in Europe um, have, uh, have introduced confidence building measures, 16 different confidence building measures over the last five years. And this dialogue also just kicked off as Slovakia is the chairman of the OSCE, focusing on number 15, the confidence building measure of how do we work regionally among our region of countries to try to actually share information to deter um, the escalation and start to understand where are the core vulnerabilities in our, in our infrastructures. These efforts and other efforts are important as we're moving forward. Last year, during the Internet Governance Forum, another United Nations activity in Paris, there was the Paris Call for Trust and Security. It was a global initiative introduced by companies to actually address the how do we work together as a multi-stakeholder um, uh, group to try to ensure the common principles for securing cyberspace. The challenge is, is that none of our governments and none of our commercial enterprises want to be held accountable for what they're doing. So we have to start to think about from a commercial perspective. We right now trust these technologies and we don't ask a lot of questions of our vendors. <coughs> and we believe they're going to work as advertised. Even the new technologies, the quantum technology, the blockchain, the artificial intelligence. But when are we going to start to anticipate when they're going to be used, um, these innovations will be used by adversaries or opponents to cause harm. To cause harm, to steal money, to use your personal identifiable information, to destroy an infrastructure, to knock out a national champion and to displace it with a different national champion under a different flag. We have to start to think about this in the context of risk, as Mr. Thomas talked about. What is our risk appetite as a company and as a government? And what risks are we willing to take? Have we done an honest assessment of what's at stake in our, at our country level? Have we? I don't think that many of our countries have. Of what are the national centers of what make us strong? And then who could make us weak or knock those things offline when they needed to be online? What risks are we not willing to accept that we have to address now with either people, money, technology, alliances, etc.? And we have to be thinking about this, not just in the immediate looking in the rear view mirror of what we did to ourselves over the last 30 years, but what we're going to do for ourselves in the next 20 years through education, through investment, through innovation, through the right uh, resource and capital requirements that are going to be required. What risks do we want to take and what uh, will our allies bear and our citizens bear? Some of our countries and some of our actual corporate environments are making decisions that are passing risk unacceptable risk onto the sovereign country and unacceptable risk within the ecosystem of commercial players. Are we going to hold them accountable for what they're doing? And are we going to hold the countries accountable for the, the risk that they're spreading across borders? And then as you start to think about it, that personnel, the capital, the operational requirements that we're going to need to manage the risk, are we really thinking about managing national cyber risk and all of what it's going to take to get there? We're not doing it well in the United States. And I haven't seen many countries that are doing it well. We're going to talk a little bit about Francesca tomorrow. We'll talk about the Cyber Readiness Index and the methodology that we developed to evaluate this at both a government level and a corporate level. But I don't think we're managing risk, managing national cyber risk. I'm not sure we're actually holding each other accountable. So as we start to think about this digital transformation, the Industry 4.0 or the Fourth Industrial Revolution that Professor Morales spoke about, 
and you start to think about the risks in the 16,550 vulnerabilities that were discovered just last year by Mr. Thomas, are we thinking about managing the risk responsibly as we move forward? Because I think we need to. Because when you start to do that, when we manage that risk responsibly, then we're actually creating opportunities for our countries, and we're starting to look at what the digital economy could deliver, not the cyber insecurity that we currently have and the tax on growth that we're going to continue to see. We need to actually manage the risk so we can see the opportunity. Thank you so much for your invitation to speak here today, and I look forward to the rest of the conference.